What's going on everyone, James Hancock here. I'm back to review episode seven of The Expanse. Well, I should say episode seven of season two of The Expanse, AKA The Seventh Man. As you can tell, I'm not in my usual man cave. I'm actually down in Florida visiting family. I've actually got my mother sleeping about 30 feet away, so hopefully I will not wake her up raining and raving about science fiction, which she declared earlier to be too scary for her to watch. Um, I should say before I dive into this review that I've been on a bit of a rampage through the books lately. I'm at the tail end of book three, and I've been reading the short stories and the novellas. It's going to be very, very hard for me to review this episode without talking a little bit about the books. But what I'll do is I'll talk about the episode first, and then I'll have like a break. And then I've got to get into some book stuff because it's impossible to talk about this episode without talking about books because of some radical departures and changes that are being made. But for people who don't want to read the books and just want to enjoy the show on its own merits, they should be able to watch reviews without constantly being annoyed by bald-headed freaks like myself telling them about the books. At any rate, I will save all that for later. So while it does pain me to say this, and I feel like I am like doing something horrible to a member of my own family by offering any sort of negative criticism of any kind. I have to say that episode 7 of season 2 is probably my least favorite episode of the season so far, and that is not to say that I don't love the show. It's not to say that it's not my favorite show on TV, because I absolutely love The Expanse, and I mark it on my calendar, and I look forward to it every week. But this episode was a combination of two weird things where you have a lot of filler, and a sense that they're almost kind of stalling because the storyline with Bobby Draper is, at this point, moving forward, going to be part of the real meat of the narrative for a while. Everything involving Bobby in this episode, I was riveted. I was totally on board. Everything else, I kind of was felt myself drifting. Once again, it's due to the fact that a lot of the stuff was made up for the show, and it just felt like it was... I'm betraying everything I said I wouldn't do at the beginning where I said I wouldn't talk about the books, but I feel like they were basically trying to stall every other narrative until they can get the Bobby narrative to a point where all the other storylines can catch up, and that's what overall made the structure of the episode kind of drag. My hope is that episodes 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13 for the rest of the season are going to be just gangbusters because, as we all remember, episode 5 of the season was one of the all-time best episodes of any TV series ever. I was totally transfixed. I love these characters. I love this environment. But I do have to be fair and honest and objective when an episode disappoints. So maybe it's just because I've been reading the books too damn much and I've been fucking loving the books. I mean, I'm completely, totally addicted. If I have a spare five-minute period, I'm reading the books. Perhaps because I'm reading book three right now, which is regarded by a lot of people as one of the best, I'm having such a great positive expanse experience there that an average episode was kind of a disappointment, which I think is fair. So what did actually happen in this episode? We get to see Bobby Draper being rescued. She's really delirious from her experience, doesn't really remember much. All she really remembers is that Earthers, a.k.a. UN soldiers, were marching toward her. With Ganymede in total chaos, millions are going to go hungry. It's a total catastrophe. And the OPA, the UN, and Mars are all trying to figure out what to do about it. On Earth, Christian worries that outright war between Earth and Mars will result in whatever the next war being, being fought with just rocks and sticks, which which is a very valid concern, because if Earth and Mars ever decided to go all out, it would be mutually assured annihilation. Bobby wakes up on the Scirocco or Scirocco and she's essentially being interrogated over the course of this episode slash pushed into accepting a certain narrative. What she doesn't realize is that she's being sent to Earth to testify before the UN about what she saw. And what they want her to say and what she's slowly remembering is not necessarily the same and she really resents it. She eventually remembers that the six Earth soldiers that were coming toward her were not firing at the Mars soldiers, they were turning around and firing at whatever was behind them. They were actually running from some threat that was terrifying them. She also remembers that after all hell broke loose and she was lying on her back, that this creature looked over her without wearing a suit. So she knows that there is something, some sort of unexplainable phenomenon at work, and the official narrative that she's being asked to push is not the full story or even anything resembling the truth. This episode, we see the return of Anderson Dawes. Anderson Dawes is played by Jared Harris, who was really good in the first season, 
and he's basically back this season to kind of undercut Fred, like you know, take him out by the knees or second guess his authority, and really just starts challenging him on a variety of fronts since. Fred was not originally from the belt. He was an Earther who eventually became a belter. And this, well, I'll get to this later, but this subplot is all stuff that's just been shoved in. And so I just have a hard time getting invested in it because I just don't know where it's leading. But we have a situation where Naomi and Holden are having to take Fred's side as Fred is being challenged by true belters. And there's just a big debate about to what extent the protomolecule remains a danger to them should they try and control it in the future. The scientist that they got from Protogen is hearing voices, so they know that the protomolecule is still out there in some way, shape, or form. Holden mistakenly believes that the protomolecule was completely destroyed when it went into the orbit of Venus, but obviously some of it remains, and it leads to Dawes and his men kidnapping the Protogen scientists and hauling ass with them. Naomi and Alex blast after them and try to chase them down, and they end up capturing a decoy as Dawes makes it away with the scientist. Sadly for now, it looks like as if Anderson Dawes is getting away with whatever his private agenda may or may not be. So here's the thing about the books first of the show. The books have a lot of characters that are in the different books that don't really carry over between the books. I mean, there are certain characters that are hugely prevalent in book one and book two and book three that just don't overlap at all. Then you have your main characters, which are the crew of the Rosinante. And I totally understand that this is a TV show, not the books, and they have to find a way to make the show succeed on its own terms. But when they bring in characters for no reason and stretch out the story and essentially stall the story, I think that is a mistake. And... Maybe it's wrong for me to second guess that with Anderson Dawes showing up, that ultimately it's going to lead to nothing because I know in books two and three that he's just not a relevant character. Then there's no real reason for me to even pay that close attention, but that's not fair because who knows? Maybe they're going to do something amazing with the character, so maybe I should just try and forget what I've read and just enjoy the show on its own terms, but it's very, very hard to keep those separate, especially when I see a lot of weird scenes being added, like Amos talking to the protogen scientist and debating whether or not he should have his own morals kind of lobotomized in his brain and things like that. It's just, it's a lot of scenes that for me ring untrue because they just don't come from the original source material. That said, the authors of the books are involved in the show, so maybe they know exactly what they're doing. So... I've loved the show to date. I've loved the books to date. So I should just have a little bit more faith and be less of a dick, kind of second-guessing some of their creative decisions. But I just have a hard time not doing so because I just I really, really love the second book quite a bit, and I just want them to stick to that story because I know there's a lot of really, really cool stuff coming our way. And I know that even if they just adapt the material from the books, they got enough material for many seasons of television that would be solid gold. And when they decide to change things, they better do so with a good reason, because if it ain't broke, don't fix it. At any rate, I'm incredibly sleep-deprived. I was at a film festival this past weekend, and then I came straight into family bonding, and I have not been sleeping well the last few days, and I've been working my butt off, and I'm kind of doing this in a half-dazed state, so I don't even know how well this is going to cut together, but fuck it, I'll cut it to the best of my ability, get the sucker up in the morning, and if... I've rubbed anyone the wrong way by second-guessing the show. I apologize. Blame it on the sleep deprivation, but I will just reiterate, I love the show, love the books. I just had some reservations about this episode. You can find me on Twitter at Colbrax, and now I'm going to go grab some Z's because I'm exhausted. Talk to you later.